to a normal place under materials, uh, and it will be due next Thursday. Uh, and then there will be a lab tomorrow in discussion, uh, which is due uh, end of the day Sunday. Um, so use the time that you get back from lecture, maybe to work on the homework, because uh, the homework, I don't think it's particularly difficult, but it is quite long, at least in my opinion. Um, so there's like a lot of questions, even if each individual question isn't that much work. So just kind of keep that in mind, or at least take a look at it before you plan your time. Um, so as far as the midterm is concerned, uh, most of the grades are done. Um, however, we have a few people who had to do a makeup exam. Uh, as you experienced, we had some network issues and some SEC issues the other day. I don't know if any of you recall that or you just block it out. Um, I know I recall it. I know I was annoyed. Uh, so we have a few people who have to make it up. Uh, so once those are in, uh, then I'll look at the grades and see if I'm happy with the basically the way the test performed. Um, right. So, you know, if the overall grade on the test, in my opinion, right, if the average grade is like really low, that means that the fault is with me or the or the exam. Right. Not with the class. Does that make sense? So that's where things like curves come in play. Uh, so. Just keep that in mind. So we should be able to release it early next week. Um, I will say I'm going to be at a conference in Detroit. Uh, that's why I'm not going to be here for lecture. Uh, and part of the uh, activities I will be doing there is interviewing people uh, in a car while driving around Detroit. Uh, this may remind you of a Seinfeld show or uh, the, the late night talk show host who does the karaoke one, which I can't think of his name. James Corden, that's it. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it will be recorded. Uh, I don't know if it'll be live streamed, but it might be. So yeah, it should be insane. But as a result, I will be very busy next week. Uh, so I'm canceling my office hours on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, no lecture on Tuesday. Uh, this is all in Piazza, if you haven't read it yet. Uh, and the syllabus will get updated because there's uh, some of the readings will be kind of like catch up. So there'll be kind of more listed readings for Thursday than there should be. Um, but it's just because we, I, I still want to do the readings up through there. I actually think the readings, I may adjust them anyway, because I actually think they're a little behind where you are. Um, and the homework, this homework relies, and I can't remember exactly what the syllabus says, but this homework does rely on most of chapter 11. So if, if I didn't list that as being read by now, just keep in mind, if you don't understand something or whatever, take a look at, at chapter 11 in the book. Any questions Does that make sense to everybody? Obviously all the usual routes to ask questions are also there, Piazza, office hours, et cetera, just not mine. Alrighty, all right, let's move on. Uh, so, oh yeah, sorry. Um, I thought I'd cut that slide out. Uh, so this is just a review of the sampling stuff we did from last time, which would have been, uh, I guess, I don't know, Sunday before today, uh, Thursday last week. Um, so uh, so you have different kinds of sampling, right? You have a deterministic sample where you're actually kind of choosing ones. And this, we typically use the tool, actually it might be on, no, okay. So we usually use the tool, like something like take, where we basically say, I want that one and that one and that one. But then you also have what's called random sampling, uh, which is when we use something like the method sample, which will pull a more random sample. Um, and this also goes back into kind of the real world, right? Uh, I use the city hall example versus a grocery store. Um, you know, it's more deterministic being in front of City Hall that if you ask people their salaries that you're going to get city employees, whereas, you know, grocery store might be more random, although we did theorize some reasons why it might not actually be random, but that's kind of what we're, we're thinking of. So these are two important terms that you should be able to, you know, regurgitate what they mean. All right, a sample of convenience. So this is kind of standing outside the grocery store where you just conveniently sample by getting anybody who will answer your questions. Um, you used to see Greenpeace do this a ton. Uh, you don't so much anymore. Now it's just Scientologists, apparently. Um, but, uh, you know, when somebody approaches you on the street and asks you to take a survey, that's basically what they're trying to do. Um, and so the, basically the, the problem with this technique is it's a potentially limited value. Because in order to actually control to get into the randomness, you have to do a lot of it, right? As you might imagine, right? You have to, you know, you have to do your sampling in front of City Hall and you have to do it in front of the grocery store. And it would help if you did it in a lot of different cities and towns, et cetera. Uh, one of the things when I was, I used to live in uh, Albany, New York, and it was really interesting there because we used to have a lot of 
uh, various things being tested by companies there because that city used to have a perfect microcosm demographic of the rest of the country. So if you tested something in Albany, New York, it was like testing it in the whole country without actually having to test it in the whole country. So I just thought it was super interesting. Uh, so we used to get a lot of cool things first. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but Burger King used to take your, or for a while, took your order, and then you could go and sit at a table with a, a bowl of popcorn, and then they would bring you your order, which they experimented with for, I think, like six months, and then they killed it. And it, you know, now Burger King is what it is. But yeah, super interesting. Um, so, sorry, turning off notifies. Um, so you basically hear some of the problems with doing this, right? Is that you have to be really careful when you pull a sample of convenience. Um, okay, so simulation and sampling functions, we've talked about these, but random choice, that's kind of the easy one where you just wanna say, just give me one of these or a set of these out of this bucket, right? Um, but then you also have like append, which is helpful in the scenario because if you wanna do some sort of simulation, for example, you want to append it, you know, you want to do each run of the result, right? You know, each deal of a deck of cards or each, you know, throw of a die, um, you need to kind of append it onto the array that, you know, you collected outside, right? Because inside the for loop, if you try to collect it there, it's just going to get thrown away because of scope rules. Okay, so you got to make sure you put something on the outside and the pen comes in handy for that. Um, it will also uh, take two arrays and append them together. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know how many people know about like parallel processing, right? You know how the Jupyter Notebook launch asks you how many CPUs do you want? Well, you could ask for, let's say 10 CPUs and using a bunch of tricks, you could actually tell Python, run this simulation on that CPU and this simulation on that CPU and kind of run them all concurrently across all the CPUs and then append all the results. Right? That would be a lot more efficient if you wanted to run, say, you know, a million, right? You could break it up across 10 CPUs and be quicker. But we are not going to get into that in this class, but that's kind of the idea of why you, you want to do things like append arrays together or you need to merge things together is sometimes you have results from different paths that you want to bring together. And also tells you a little bit about parallelism, which is super interesting. All right, so then we're going to talk about distributions, but we're going to flip, switch to... Uh, some code here once I find the right window. All right. I do not see my mouse at all. Okay. Grab this thing. Oops. All right, so we run the first one. Uh, this should be in the materials as well. Uh, I presume at least somebody got it. It's there. Did I put it in the right place? Okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to create a uh, table of dice rolls, okay? So that we have something to kind of sample from. Um, and then we're going to throw an error because I haven't touched the question marks yet. Um, why is this not scrolling for me? There we go. Okay. Uh, so, do you may remember what I use here to uh, get, you know, a selection of roles? Example. All right. So, what that'll do is it'll basically pick one randomly out of the table 10 times. Okay. Um, and try to figure out what's next. And so then what we want to do is we want to take that sample, right? Um, and start thinking about how do we, we want to look at the distribution, right? So if we want to know if we're doing some sort of simulation, for example, we want to know about the dice rolling. We want to be able to look at that distribution and a little bit of this should be repeat from last time. Um, but we would take our roles and first we're going to make a bin you know various bin sizes um and we'll see that we're kind of using slightly unusual bin sizes so that it ends up with a pretty picture okay um, but if you notice they're not 
uh, different sizes, right? They're the same size for each one. It's just, we're kind of making it so that the histogram will kind of lay out more nicely. All right, so what do we put here? Does anybody know to uh, get a histogram using that roll bins uh, for the bins amounts? Right on. Right, and so now we have a nicer histogram, right? Because we kind of split up the bin so that instead of taking the default, which would have been like zero to one, and then one to two, we did it at the halves so that the bins would look better, basically. All right, sometimes that can be really useful when you're trying to explain something. So uh, obviously the 10 is not gonna show us very much like what we would expect, right? We can guess with a die, what do we expect this histogram to look like? Just flat, right? Like it's an even distribution of rolls should should land in there. But when we only sample 10, that's not big enough to actually get a realistic result. So instead, let's try a thousand. That's still not big enough, right? So that's it kind of gives you a sense of the scale, right? We're only talking about six options. So when we when we talk about um and one of the semesters, uh I showed a clip from a there's a movie called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, which is about two of the characters in Hamlet uh, that you see at kind of three different points in the book or in the play. And uh, it's the, the movie, which is actually based on a play, uh, is about what are they doing when they're not on stage, right? If, as if they were real people somehow. Uh, and it's really interesting because it's all about determinism because they're fictional, right? So there's a whole big scene of them flipping coins and always getting the same side up. Um, but Kind of the point here is that you flip a coin, right? You expect, even if you flip it only three times, that you're going to get 50%, well, four times, 50% distribution, right? But it's really not. You really have to do it a lot before you start to get something that looks flat, right? And that's even at whatever that is, 100,000, that's still not flat, right? So this is just to kind of give you a sense of the scale because we're going to talk about large random samples in a minute. All right, any questions so far? Okay. All right. So a probability distribution is all the possible values of the quantity and the probability of each of those values. So this is kind of a label we put on this sort of distribution. Um, and it's a random quantity with various possible values. Um, yeah, and so I have, a, as a note to myself, you can, um, you know, if you with a probability distribution, you can actually figure out the math, right, of the distribution if you want to. So my head's example, right? I know off the top of my head that this distribution is fifty percent, right? Or with the die, uh, we know the distribution is whatever one sixth, right? Um, so those are easy, but if it's if it's more complicated, it might be easier to actually run a simulation like I did uh, to figure out what the distribution is rather than actually calculating it. Does that make sense? So again, I go back to programmers are lazy. If we can avoid it, we don't really do math. We just write programs that do the math for us. All right, an empirical distribution is based on observations. So observations can be uh, from repetitions of an experiment, but empirical distribution all observe values and the proportion of times each value appears. So this is uh, you going, like let's say you wanna know, actually we have a, a future, uh, lecture we're going to talk about pea plants. Um, so as you may or may not know, uh, peas uh, have actually really pretty flowers and they come in different colors. Uh, and so if you had a field of pea plants, right, and you went and looked at each color of each one, that would be based on observation, right? You would go and kind of individually look at it. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. So back to large random samples and why they are interesting. Ah. All right, and we're going to look at uh, a data set we've looked at before, um, and we will probably look at again, um, but basically those united flight times. Um, and so all this is doing is just kind of rearranging it a bit and making it a little easier to read. Um, so we have the date, the flight number, 
target city, like where it's going, and its delay in minutes on uh, leaving the city, or leaving its origin. Um, sorry, I said that backwards. Uh, it's late arrival, I believe. Um, but it doesn't really matter for the sake of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to make some bins, but we're going to kind of uh, ignore that for, oh, this is kind of a stupid order. Um, but we're going to make some bins. And what we notice here, right, is that this is a histogram, right? But like, can somebody tell me, you know, the stuff that's in the bin over here, how many are there, right? It's very hard to tell. So um, what we might want to do is think about, do we want to get rid of, I think we get rid of the outliers in this example. Um, let me just make sure I'm looking at the right thing. Yeah, so the, the challenge we have is that we want to like look at a subset of the data so that we can maybe get a better distribution. So in order to do that, we're still going to use sampling. So, so this is a little bit unrealistic because this data set is actually not that big. So imagine, right, if we were doing this for real, we had a distribution that was, you know, a, a million rows, or sorry, not a distribution, but a data set that was a million rows. We might want to take part of it out and try to figure out, you know, various things about how that distribution is taking place within the million without actually calculating on the million. Does that make sense to you? Right? Because let's say we had all the United flights for, and I think I was saying this the other day. So we had all the United flights for a year, or maybe all airlines flights all together for a year. You can imagine that's a ridiculous amount of data. So what we want to do is be able to figure out what's the smallest amount of data we can sample from that data set and actually get a reasonable distribution. So when we were doing it with the dice, right, I kept going up in numbers trying to get to the distribution. I actually, in this case, kind of want to go down to try to figure out how to do that. So first thing we need to do though is we need to make sure we know what the min and the max are. And usually it's helpful to know what the average is to try to figure out, are we getting a good answer? Um, and then we can start the sample and we can see here, right? That this sample is probably too small because this histogram is kind of just wacky looking, right? It's got a lot of gaps um, as well as, I mean, it does seem to kind of grab the, the right-ish area as being the tallest part, but this seems really wrong, right? Because if you look at the other one up here, this, that line is, you know, it's about here. It's not that tall, right? So it, it, the sampling was kind of an error, probably because we only took 10 samples, okay? So instead we wanna do something like taking a thousand samples, and as you can see here, like we still have that little bit of a problem of that we have those outliers out on the edge, which we'll talk about actually in a future lecture about how can we get rid of those or when is it legitimate to get rid of outliers. But for now, what we can see is that, hey, if we sample a thousand out of the whatever total data was uh, like a uh, little, little shy of 14,000, um, we can actually get to a pretty good distribution, right? That's pretty close in looks to the other one. So in other words, in this case, right, for 14,000, let's say we didn't want to calculate it, but we're doing this for a class, so it's a little weird. But let's say we didn't want to calculate it for the 14,000, we can make a good guess that 1,000 is enough for that distribution. So obviously we don't compare it, or we can't compare it to some other state. So like I said, they, let's just say that all of the airline flights for a year were a million, we can't just do the math and say, okay, then it should be, I don't know, whatever, a 14th of the data set. It's gonna be a little bit more complicated than that. And we'll talk about that more in the future. Um, but you get the idea is that if we have a sufficiently large sample size, we can do a good approximation of the real data set. Okay, so in other words, you know, when we're doing the die rolling, if we roll the die enough times, we can simulate the actual sample set or the actual data set. And the data set like on die rolls, right? It's just kind of infinite. You know, in airline flights, it's also kind of infinite, assuming we have plane flights forever, but it's essentially infinite. So what we wanna be able to do is take a data set, a smaller piece of it and make and try to understand the distribution of it without actually knowing what all the data is. Does that seem valuable to everyone? That makes sense? All right. 
So let's go back and talk about large samples a little more. Well, what my computer is doing that is requiring so much horsepower. <clears throat> All right. So this is referred to as the law of large numbers. So, and this is, you know, kind of a proper definition where if a chance experiment is repeated many times independently and under the same conditions, then the proportion of times that an event occurs gets closer to the theoretical probability of the event. So this is like in the sense of math, right? It's a law in that sense. It has been proven, okay? So has anyone ever heard of the theory of evolution? <clears throat> Raise your hand. You ever heard of it? Ring any bells? Anybody know why it's called a theory? Because it hasn't been proven, right? But the the sample set that is unproven is like this big, right? But we can't prove it definitively. So in other words, it's still a theory, okay? Even though it's a well-accepted theory. So this is also particularly interesting for me. Has anyone ever heard of the traveling salesman problem? Okay, do you know what it is? Or can you explain? Actually, any number of nodes, but yeah. So, so it's basically exactly what it sounds like. A salesman has to go to all their different customers and wants to take the shortest route to do so. This is one of those things that's actually, if you look at it, is very intuitively easy for a human to figure out, assuming the data set is relatively small, right? However, it's a very hard thing for a computer or a calculation to do well. So uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, this has been a long-standing problem because there's big organizations like the U.S. Postal Service, like FedEx, like UPS, who really, really, really want to know what the shortest route between locations is, right? So some number of years ago, um, they've had various proofs of the various parts of various parts of the problem set. So like I'm making this up, but one person proved uh, how to answer the problem for one to five locations and another person proved seven to 10 locations and another one proved all ones between 100 and 3000, right? But there were gaps all over the place. And so uh, there was a mathematician who actually used a computer and just calculated the rest and just cheated, right? They didn't come up with a theory. They didn't come up with any math. They just tested the rest, okay? And as a result, now we actually have a proven kind of law around the traveling salesman problem. Uh, but it's interesting just because not all of it was done through math. Um, and I was also really excited because I happened to be at the math conference where it was initially presented, which was kind of cool. Um, so um, has anybody ever heard of the law of averages or the gambler's fallacy? They're kind of slangy, but just ring, ring any bells. You know what it is? Right. So that's specifically the gambler's fallacy, right? So this is the idea of you're, you know, like in a casino, right? And you're having a hot run, right? It's not true, okay? Like uh, maybe if there's karma in the world or maybe if there's a God in the world who's like reaching down and fixing it for you, but from a probability perspective, it's not true, okay? So as a result, you know, if I flip a coin 30 times and every single time I get tails, that doesn't mean I'm gonna get heads next, right? I can still get tails again, just as easily. So this is the gambler's fallacy. You get this kind of like the human instinct is that it's gonna flip, right? Um, and so that's why we have this law of large numbers because we have to find a large enough number that we're not suffering from gambler's fallacy, basically, all right? Um, So I had a, another, yeah, there, there was a really specific example about a casino and, uh, and uh, uh, what do you call it, slot machine um, that I can't remember the, the exact story of, but it was kind of cool of somebody like falling for this really badly. Um, so the law of large numbers, is it a big enough sample size? So basically that's what you're trying to figure out. The empirical distribution matches the real distribution. So this is the idea behind medical trials, okay, is when you do a medical trial of a drug, you need to make sure you've proven basically before the trial will be started or funded or whatever, that you have 
uh, a big enough distribution in the population that you're putting uh, in the, you know, into the trial, as well as controlling for all those confounding factors that we talked about, right? Um, and has anybody ever heard of a, like a placebo? So that's, you know, kind of the control group of placebo. Um, but what's super interesting about placebos is that sometimes they actually cure the disease or at least the symptoms because of what's called the placebo effect, because you believe that the placebo is the real drug, uh, which is also super interesting. Humans are weird. All right, so but now we get into what's called a statistic. And that is, um, and here we have more name collisions between uh, kind of data science and programming and math and, um, and where they mean slightly different things to, in different contexts. Uh, but so we have a parameter, which is a number associated with the population. So in other words, it is, um, you know, I don't know, like uh, a red blood cell count, okay? Like, you know, that, that it's just a number, okay? Um, whereas a statistic is a number calculated from the sample. So the most common one, right, is the average, is a statistic, okay? Does that make sense? So parameter is like a real thing. And a statistic is something that you calculate from a real thing or a set of real things. All right. Um, and then so, and then we have inference, which is when you use statistics to make a conclusion based on data in random samples. Um, so, so you use existing data to guess the value of an unknown number. So you create an estimate of the unknown quantity. So why is this interesting, right? This is where we want to start to do prediction type stuff. Okay, so if we have the United plane flights information, can we start to figure out ways to make predictions about whether the next flight will be delayed? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna use inference to figure that out. And again, this is more kind of the formal terminology uh, and how it's used in the field. Uh, so, you know, most people will understand you when you're kind of talking about these things if you use slightly different words, but it's kind of like if you're writing a paper or a news story or a whatever, you know, you should use the real words that everyone has agreed on the definitions. Um, because as I often say, English is terrible. Um, so does anybody have any examples or any ideas for when something like inference would be useful or a prediction would be useful? And I always like to see if the one I most expect comes up. So that's why I kind of asked the question. What would be a really useful thing you can make predictions about? The stock market, that is the one. Um, so the stock market, it'd be really, really nice to be able to say, hey, that company is gonna go up in dollar value at this rate, okay? However, it's incredibly difficult to do that. Does anybody know why it's so difficult? Because it seems just like a math problem, right? Can you give a couple examples? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, currently the CEO of Tesla is being sued over the fact that he made an announcement he was going to do something which affected the stock. Um, and that is illegal in the U.S. Um, and so, uh, so that's one of the examples. Another huge example, which is really, I think, what makes it so unpredictable, is that humans are weird, okay? In other words, if a bunch of humans see an IBM stock is up today, they are the parent company of Red Hat, so I, I know, you know, I kind of keep an eye on them. Um, but IBM stock is up today. Um, so when IBM stock goes up, that may trigger a bunch of people to buy it for no particularly good reason, no like mathematical reason or anything else, except that they have this gut feel that it's going to do better, right? Or maybe the reverse. And the problem is, or maybe the reverse, right? Is that you really have no way to predict how people are going to react. Um, and a friend of mine and I, who've both been very interested in markets uh, for a very long time, um, and we've kind of played around with various things, are both super interested in watching Bitcoin because Bitcoin. Uh, you know, conveniently doesn't suffer from any law around what is legal or illegal uh, in the Bitcoin market. Uh, so unlike the SEC, which regulates the stock market, you can't do all kinds of things like what's called a pump and dump, 
or you can't do like the Tesla thing. Um, you can't do that kind of stuff. It's illegal. You will go to jail. Um, you know, does anybody know who Martha Stewart is? Uh, do you know she went to jail for insider trading? Um, did you know she used to be a stockbroker? And that's particularly why she went to jail for insider trading. Um, so you will go to jail. Um, but Bitcoin is super interesting because you can do all of these wildly illegal things in the stock market in Bitcoin. Or from my friend and I's perspective, we can watch them happen and see what the characteristics are and like maybe start to model, can we detect one happening in the stock market? by watching a bunch of Bitcoin once, right? Can we gather data from Bitcoin where it's illegal and then use that to actually catch people who are doing something illegal in the stock market? So that's why it's particularly interesting for me. All right, uh, probability distribution of a statistic. That's easy for me to say and everyone else. So the values of a statistic vary between, because random samples vary. Um, so sampling distribution, probability distribution of the statistic is all possible values and all the corresponding probabilities, and it can be difficult to calculate, okay? Um, however, what you can do is essentially, um, you know, you can use software to do it for you without using the math. Excuse me. All right, and then the empirical distribution of a statistic. Oh, I forgot my little uh, splash thing for the demo. Um, empirical distribution of a statistic. So based on simulated values of the stat, uh, all the observed values of the stat, proportion of times each value was observed. Um, you know, a lot of this, I think it's kind of like, you know, you kind of just need to internalize these details so that you know what the terminology means. And then we're gonna show some examples in a few seconds. Um, so it's often, and this I think is kind of important, a good approximation to the probability distribution of the statistic. This is why I hate writing all of these words on slides, but uh, I do it so that you can look at it later and remember what we were talking about. Um, but it's harder to, I think it's harder to understand while you're reading it and trying to listen at the same time. Um, if the number of repetitions in the simulation is large, uh, that's when it works, okay? Let's see, is there a demo? No, no, sad. I like my little explosion. All right, so let's see some statistics examples and simulating statistics. Okay, so as we said before, um, over here's another example of a statistic, which is the median. Um, and so when, when is the median useful compared to the average or the mean? Any ideas? Any other ideas? All right, how about you? Outliers and what what happens exactly? Right. Right. It's also really really useful to compare to the average. So if the median and the mean are very close together, it means there aren't a lot of outliers, which is an interesting thing to know when you're looking at a big data set. Um, but if they're really far apart, it probably means there's a lot of outliers. Um, so sometimes the median is more useful than the mean, um, but sometimes it's not. So uh, that's kind of, but we're using it here because as you saw in the histogram, there's a whole mess of outliers, particularly out on the right-hand side, right? We had one flight that was an hour delayed, right? So the median is actually two minutes, okay? And then the median, if we pull a sample, but we're only sampling 10, is one, okay? So we're calculating a statistic on a sample of the actual data set, but clearly our sampling is not good, right? We're not choosing a big enough sample size to, in order to get a, a good approximation of the real median, okay? And in theory, like we should get different answers. Yeah, three and a half, right? So that's clearly not a good sample size. All right, so let's say, if we wanted to make a method that would do this sampling, but for arbitrary sizes, so we can kind of test for it, and we know how we would do that. So I'll start with the easy part. This is MP, me, me, no, median, easy for me to say. And then what do I do next? Yeah. Uh, 
United Rock Central and then Side to get in the number. And then stop calling for that. Exactly. Um, wait, I stopped her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that's going to give us a method that's going to give us the median for any arbitrary size sample. Okay. So now we can call it and, you know, we're still getting wildly wrong values, um, but we know that it's at least doing what it's supposed to be doing, or we think it's supposed to be doing. Um, so now let's say we want to do um, a better job, right? So, but for whatever reason, let's say we don't want to change the sample size. So what can we do to increase our kind of our largeness, right? How can we make it a larger uh, result without actually increasing our sample size? Any idea? And, and there's a bit of a hint in the way that things are tabbed. Yeah. Not quite. Just display or calculate. Um, okay, how would we do that? Right, so like kind of, right? Um, so yeah, so we wanna do a for loop and we can say I in, and we're gonna do kind of an arbitrary answer and do a thousand, okay? But what we're gonna do for the thousand times is we're actually gonna say new median equals um, sample median. And we're gonna stick with that 10, okay? However, if we collect them, uh, let's see, NP10, um, then I'm just going to print it for the sake of doing it. Okay, and so this will take a bit to run and have an error. Uh, oh, it's funny, my uh, default is new media instead of new medium. Um, so we have a whole bunch of examples, right? Yay, okay. So, but now we have them all collected in a non-scrolling output. Um, but so now what we can do though, is we can take our sample medians and we can actually put them on a histogram. So remember, so we were looking at a histogram of the overall data set or the sample of the data set. But now what we want to do is instead of that, we actually want to look at the medians as a histogram. So just kind of keep in mind, right? Because at least for me, when, you know, it's like we're, we're context switching here, right? So this is where the medians are. So we took, you know, 10 samples and then we did that a thousand times. And these are all the different medians we got, okay? And so obviously we'd get some outliers and we get some outliers over here. Um, and what we see though, is that because we just ran the simulation enough times, our median is actually pretty close to right, okay? Or what's in the middle or the tall thing or whatever you want to call it, right? So, um, and that kind of tells us that if we run that sample, even though the sample itself wasn't great, okay? If we run the sample enough times, it's almost like doing a bigger sample. Follow? So this going back to the million example, right? Is that it may be too expensive to even sample a sufficiently large amount of the million itself. Like let's instead say it's a hundred million rows, right? Or a thousand million rows. I mean, tons and tons of data is getting generated all the time. So in order to get a proper distribution of that, we actually would need to take, I don't know, let's say, you know, if it was a terabyte or whatever, um, let's say we still needed to operate on several million rows. As you might imagine, that's, that's really expensive. But if we get it down to say 100,000, but run the 100,000 a thousand times, maybe we could get in the same neighborhood. 
follow me? All right. So basically, a lot of what we're trying to do with kind of data science, right, is we're trying to legitimately take our massive data sets and get results out of them without actually doing the work. Okay. Um, and, it, and like I said, it can be a little bit misleading when we do this stuff in the class because obviously I wanted to run in real time and be able to show you the real example that we're comparing it to. Um, but you know, if you go and take a look at like the blue bites data, uh, the the data it's just it's ridiculously big. Um, and I think we have an example of that here too. But let's see. Um, now, obviously, what I could also do here is if I want even better results, um, I can try to actually increase my sample size as well. So I can also just run a thousand times, but with my, I'm just gonna cut and paste this from above so that I don't have to type it all. Wouldn't it be nice if this was a function? Um, but this time, I'm gonna run a thousand size sample a thousand times. So that's gonna take a second. And now obviously I get theoretically a better result, but it's more expensive to get there. Okay. And as you can see, it really is better. Like it's really close, right? And part of the the outliery lookingness is because our bin size is throwing it off a bit. Okay. Like it's it's making it wider. Um, but yeah, as you can see, like when I increase my sample size and my sample iteration, or like the number of times I sample, um, I get a much better result. All right, so another example. Um, so I can warn you that this is actually a somewhat cleaned up data set. Um, so it's actually one month from 2021 of trips on blue bikes in Boston. Okay. Um, and as you can see, there's nearly 207,000 records. And I think that's after I deleted a whole bunch to make it actually like not crunch in class. So you can actually access this data yourself at data.boston.gov if you want to go play around with it or a whole bunch of other data sets. Um, it's really quite fun. Um, so let's say we want to ask the question of um, what is the kind of average commutes for this population, right? Um, and we're just going to assume for the sake of this conversation that um, <clears throat> any commute is less than 1800, uh, I think, yeah, it's, I want to say it's minutes. So in other words, we're going to say for the sake of argument that it's a commute if it's less than 1800 minutes, but it's a like going for a ride in the park uh, if it's longer than that. Does that make sense? Like seem plausible. Um, so how would I only get that data set? And the table is called trip. Well, let me catch up with <laughs> trip duration and then our test. Yeah, our below, below 1800. Yeah. I was like, do I have a bug? Because, uh, you know, it's definitely possible. Right? Okay. So now we've limited our data set to what we're saying our commutes and we. We just imagine that we spoke to some expert and they told us that when people are riding blue bikes, it's always a commute if it's less than 1800 uh, minutes. Um, oh, yeah, I, actually, that might be second. I don't know, I can't remember. Doesn't matter. Point is, what we can see though is that we get our distribution. Most people, as you imagine, have, yeah, that's got it. 1800 minutes is ridiculously long. Um, yeah, so it's gotta be, it's gotta be second. 
Um, so most of our trip durations are kind of on the shy side, right? Most people prefer a short commute, right? Um, as much as possible, or the, if they're biking to their commute, it's likely a short distance. So that's kind of what we're starting to see here. Um, and yeah, so it's definitely second. Um, it's funny, I look, I go through all of these before every lecture and there's always something I forget to like remember or check up on before I go and talk about it. Um, so this is just kind of changing that distribution so we get a little bit more resolution uh, so that we can see it a little better where, you know, where the fall off is, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so let's say we wanted to find out, and we did this in various places, uh, we wanted to find out how many people or the percent of people, sorry, who have a ride duration between 500 and 250 seconds, if we wanted to calculate it based on what we see here. Any ideas? All right, we will do the math by saying 250 and multiplying that by 0 0.15, okay? And so if that's the percent of people who have a duration that's at, uh, that, that between those amounts of time, um, and then, what was I looking for? Um, yeah, and so what we want to do is try to now start to think about, can we figure out, like, can we, can we like, visualize a way of understanding the commuters and where they're kind of coming from? And so we're going to do a group again. by start station name. Usually I go through the uh, column names, but and count sending equals true. So we want to know kind of what are the most popular stations. amongst the commuters, right? Not against the original data set. So it looks like there's a lot of rides that start at MIT. And then, uh, you know, a fair number that start at Central Square and Harvard Square, and then Beacon Street, et cetera, right? And so now we know these are the most popular start locations for a commuter who's doing the blue bikes, right? So, but then we want to look at that data maybe a little bit more cleanly or a little bit, you know, a little easier to understand. So this is when we use a pivot table, right? So we're just doing essentially our group by, except using it, laying it out as a grid rather than basically just one big long column. So instead of here, we can actually look at, hey, look at all these start locations. Maybe we can start to pinpoint um, the start and end station names, is there a lot of overlap between them? I don't know. This is kind of where we start to explore like, hey, what are the kinds of things we can ask about this data? Um, and that's what's kind of cool about doing some of this stuff. Um, and then we can kind of say, okay, what are the longest trips between stations? Okay, which is kind of interesting, right? Because this is going back to itself, right? And uh, I thought there was, I thought there were a couple examples of that. Oh yeah, here's another one. Um, so basically it's somebody who's, you know, going out on a trip, right? And then they're coming, circling around and coming back. And because this is the overall trip data, so it could be like all day trips. Um, but the, uh, you know, if we did it with the commuter ones, would it be less often that they're coming back to the same one? Like basically what are we trying to figure out with a commute? Do we want to know, um, like, is somebody keeping the bike the whole day? Right, because they, if they come back to the same station and they were commuting, it seems likely that they would have dropped it off, right? Or they stayed with it the whole day or something. There's something weird going on there. But in the longer trips, maybe they just kept it the whole day and that's, the, that's why it's coming back to the same station. Um, another piece of cool data that's on boss.data.gov is the actual locations of where all the stations are. 
So basically, this is where joins come in handy, okay? Where I'm not doing join right now, but I have the start station name here, but nowhere in the trip data does it actually say where that is exactly. So we have another table that's called the stations table that actually says, here's that name that we can look it up by, it's latitude and longitude, um, and then we could do something like if it's probably only be able to do it if we drop columns after doing a join, right? Or try to join it so that we can say, okay, let's draw on a map what all the different stations look like in their trip durations. And so we have, and this is not ever going to be on a test, but what we can do is we have cool things where we can actually look at location data. This is zooming really awesome. Let me see if I can get it to actually separate um but as you can see there's a lot of blue bike stations right but so we can actually just drop that on a map and now we can actually start to ask interesting questions like another thing we could do maybe not using this exact uh functionality but what we could do is we could actually map all those commuting routes right and maybe that's an indicator of where we should put in bike lanes right things like that so I just kind of want to show you what I think is a cool example of actual real world data that is, you know, yeah, it's about a year old, but, you know, you can go and download this month's blue bike data right now. Um, so, yeah, uh, and I think, do you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, it's like if you click on the little thing. Well, of course, it doesn't seem to be working at the moment, but it's supposed to uh, show that column as the label. Um, but it's probably related to the resolution and all that that I'm trying to get to. Um, but uh, that's what it's supposed to be doing. The blue dot should be a location that you can click on, and then you'll get that column name. Or it could all it could very well be I have a typo. Any other questions? <laughs> 